Hey folks, welcome back to another lesson and this is the final bit of our course here. So there's three lessons and then we're completely finished with the course. So we're going to look at something called the Bohr model of the atom and uh, we're going to describe Rutherford's model of the atom and the experiment that he did to show it was correct. We're going to describe the structure of the Bohr model of the atom and how it requires this idea of quantization to work. And then we're going to use the terms ground state, energy levels, ionization, and zero potential correctly. Now, there is a little bit of overlap with chemistry. So if you're doing higher chemistry, you might find this lesson a little bit more straightforward with the terminology. OK, so to begin with, uh, by the end of the 19th century, start of 20th century, um, there were two main opposing models of what the atom looks like. So the two models were, were the following. Number one was Thomson's plum pudding model. And the idea of Thomson's plum pudding model was that the atom was a positive sphere with the electrons kind of evenly distributed around that positive sphere. The opposing model was Rutherford's model, and it's the one that you are familiar with. And it's the idea that you had a really positive nucleus that contained the protons and neutrons. And orbiting around these, um, uh, this positive nucleus would be these electrons. And uh, how did we come to, to prove that Rutherford's model was correct and Thomson's one was wrong? Well, as always, to prove things, we do an experiment. So let's look at Rutherford's model uh, of the atom and how he was able to prove this was actually correct. So Rutherford does something called the gold foil scattering experiment. And the experiment's very simple. He took a source of alpha radiation, which he then fired towards a gold foil. And he had a detector going around it to see what would happen to the alpha particles as they pass through the gold foil. So the question you might be asking, how does Rutherford's experiment prove that his model was correct? Well, if we looked at the two models, first of all, Thomson's plum pudding model, in that model, because the electrons are uh, evenly spread out, the expectation would be would, is that there would be lots of gaps so that alpha particles could pass through them unhindered. So if the Thomson's model was correct, then when you passed your detector around the other side, you would just detect the alpha particles carrying on in a straight line. So you wouldn't detect any difference at all or very little difference in terms of the path of the alpha particles. If it was the Rutherford model, however, again, you would have large areas where there was nothing, so the alpha particles could pass through fairly uh, kind of unhindered. However, occasionally, the alpha particles may come across the nucleus. And remember, alpha particles are positively charged, the nucleus are positively charged. So what happens when we get light charges? You're gonna get some repulsion or some scattering or uh, deflection. And wonders of wonders, when Rutherford did this experiment, his results agreed with his model. And what he found was that some of the alpha particles would get deflected or bounced back the way. And so he was able to prove that his model was the correct one for an atom. So Rutherford's mother, model of the atom works very well. It's the one that we teach you sort of in the first, second year. It's also what we call the classical model of the atom. OK, now, uh, as we now know, the uh, structure of the atom is not as simple as that. And in fact, to be able to describe the model of an atom correctly, you actually have to use quantum mechanics. OK, so how did we know that Rutherford's model wasn't really the correct answer for what an atom looks like? Well, in general, Rutherford's model works very well. OK, however, as always, the reason why we know it wasn't working was because it couldn't explain some of the things that we were able to observe. And one thing it can't explain is how line spectra are formed. To fully explain this, we require a quantum model. Now, in the next couple of lessons, we'll actually delve into this a little bit more. But before we get into this, let's look at what the quantum model of an atom is. Now, the quantum model of an atom was really first uh, proposed by a physicist called Niels Bohr. And you can see he actually won the Nobel Prize for being able to explain line spectra based on his model of an atom. 
Now, in order to come up with his atom, he had to use ideas from Planck and this idea of quantization of energy. So Bohr's model of an atom is a quantum mechanical description of the atom. And when he realized how to explain it using quantum mechanics, he actually said this was the happiest moment of his life, even happier than when he had his first born child, I suppose. OK, so what was Bohr's model of the atom? Well, to begin with, Bohr uh, looked at a hydrogen atom because a hydrogen atom is the simplest atom you can have. It's got one proton and one electron. OK, and he stuck with the same idea of having a positive nucleus, which uh, contained all the protons, and then the idea that the electrons were orbiting around the, the proton uh, or the nucleus. Now, the key thing that, that Bohr realised was the following, and if you could copy this down as well. And he said that the electron in, an at in a hydrogen atom moves around the nucleus only in certain allowed circular orbits. So only in certain uh, allowed circular orbits. Now, to build on this idea, he then said that each orbit has a specific energy or quanta, which was kind of like uh, Planck's idea of waves existing as packets of energy. And the energy could actually be calculated by HF. So you can see how he's used Planck's idea of quantization of energy energy of radiation existing as packets and relating it to the energy of electrons inside the atom as being a fixed amount. So this was uh, the idea that gave Bohr the Nobel Prize. OK, now to actually represent these energy levels, we don't represent them with circular uh, diagrams. We actually represent them as kind of like a ladder. OK, so you can see here we've got these different energy levels. So energy levels are represented as horizontal steps, and they can, they can be calculated by this equation, E is equal to HF. Now, you might have noticed you've got negative energy levels, and you might ask, well, why do we have energy levels? Because surely energy is a scalar, we don't have negative energies. And there's a very good reason for that, and it's the following, okay? The negative energy levels represent the fact that there is an attractive force between the electron and the positive nucleus. So what we're actually trying to do is we're using this energy to separate these two things. Any extra energy is positive and usually in the form of kinetic energy. So what we mean by that is we need energy, we need to put energy in to separate the electron from the protons. Once the electron and protons are fully separated, that's when the electron has zero energy. And if we give it more energy, then that extra energy is positive and in the form of a kinetic energy. So how does that relate to a diagram? Well, you can see here that at the lower energy levels, the energy is much, much bigger. It's 13.6 compared to 3.4, 1.5 and 0.5. And at the very top one, the energy is zero. And that's why the energy level n equal to infinity is equal to zero, because we're assuming at an infinite distance, the electron and proton has no more attraction with each other. So the best way to think of this is just remember the negative just means there's an attractive force. It's got nothing to do with the fact that it's a negative energy. That's the best way to think about that. OK, now key features of the energy level, so you need to know this, is that the ground state is usually n equal to zero or n equal to one, depending on the diagram that the excited state is any state above the ground state, and that zero potential is the energy level that is at an infinite distance. And that's just the way we define these. Now, you're not expected to know the names of these Lyman, Balma, and Paschen series, but they do come up quite a lot if you study uh, line spectra in more detail. Now, how does the... Uh, uh, the, the energy levels work. So here are the rules for an, analysing energy levels. So first of all, an electron can move between any number of levels, and the technical term for that is transition. So try and use that word and try and use it to say electrons can transition between any number of levels. This energy level is exactly the difference in energy level between two levels. 
hence quantization of energy. And all I mean by that is that in order for an electron to go from one energy level to the next one, so say we have an electron here and it goes down to this energy level, then the energy that you've got to provide must be exactly enough to get it from here down to here. Okay, so it's going to be exactly enough to get from here to here. If you give it just a little bit more, it's, it's wrong, it's not going to work. So one way I imagine this is imagine this as like going up the stairs. Every time you go up a set of stairs, you must go the exact number of steps. You can't go, say, half a step, because if you go half a step, your feet's touching nothing, it doesn't work. You can go multiple steps, okay, because if you go multiple steps, you can still hit a stair. Now, the ionization energy is when the electron has enough energy to be removed from the atom. Now, I know some of these rules seem a bit obscure. We will do some work examples later on to kind of put this into context. So make sure you know these rules, write them down uh, in your notes, and then we'll do some work examples in the next lesson to help you figure out what this means. OK, so here's a wee summary. You can copy these up, folks. OK, ground state is the lowest energy level an electron can be found in an atom. This energy level is also closest to the nucleus. The excited state is an energy level which an electron can move to if it gains or loses energy. The ionization level is the final energy level that is furthest from the nucleus. This is also the energy that is needed to remove an electron from an atom, making it an ion. And we'll build on these ideas over the next two lessons.